This afternoon, it's my pleasure to introduce Mary Pfeiffer to discuss her new book, Women Rowing North, Navigating Life's Currents and Flourishing as We Age. Among her many books is her 1994 now classic, Reviving Ophelia, in which, as a cultural anthropologist and psychologist, she challenged our narratives and assumptions about teenage girls. In her new book, she challenges our assumptions about older women. For instance, did you know that according to a recent study, the happiest demographic is women over 65? <laughs> As we age, we women are called upon to expand our sense of identity and change the ways we think and behave. Drawing on interviews with women from all kinds of backgrounds, Mary Pfeiffer shows how we don't have to become diminished versions of ourselves as we age. Instead, we can cultivate emotional resilience, wisdom and authenticity, even in the face of illness and loss. Please join me in welcoming Mary Pfeiffer to Politics and Prose. Hello all, thank you coming, for coming on such a beautiful spring day. My husband and I are coming from Nebraska where we're having floods, we've had blizzards. And so today walking around DC and looking at a few trees starting to burst and oh my gosh, it's so wonderful and beautiful. I love to come to politics and prose. This is my home store away from home. So it's wonderful to be back and to see you all. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> women Roy North is about the specific issues women face as we transition from middle age to old age. And the core concern of this life stage with all its perils and pleasures is how to cultivate resilient responses to the challenges we face. Resilience is built by attention and intention. We can take responsibility for our attitudes and focus on our strengths and our joys. We can go deep and face the truth squarely. We can learn the skills that allow us to adapt to anything, and I mean anything. I'll give you an example of that. I knew an old jazz musician. If you read Another Country, I wrote about her in that book, Jane Jarvis. She was a states, they called her a statesman of jazz because they didn't have a, a word for a stateswoman of jazz. But she was a beautiful pianist and she came to Nebraska and I met her and interviewed her for Another Country. Well, later I went to visit her. She was about 96 years old in New York City. And she's in a tiny little apartment. She was wheelchair and bed bound. And um, she had a window that faced out on a wall and a caregiver who came in and helped her now and then. She was very happy. We got her over to the bed and she played piano for me. I always had asked for a sad song like Autumn Leaves and she'd go, Mary, you need to cheer up. And she'd play something <laughs> real happy for me. But uh, she'd had a hard life. She um, was a uh, child prodigy in Indiana and her parents were both music teachers and they died. They'd been on the way to teach some music classes and been hit by a train when she was 11 and killed. So she was an orphan. She had three marriages. We were talking about her marriages, and I asked her, well, what was the name of your second husband? Because she told me about the first and third, and she goes, oh, I forget that guy's name. I mean, she's just <laughs> funny that way, you know. But anyway, so I'm visiting her little place, and we're visiting away, and, and as I left... I thought how small her world was in this little place. And I said, Jane, are you all right? Are you happy? And she looked at me with a big smile and she goes, Mary, I've got everything I need to be happy right between my ears. And that's, that's where we all want to be. That's where we want to be in this life stage. When I tell people that I'm writing a book about older women Here's what they respond to immediately. They either go, I'm not old, or they go, you're not old. Uh, but what they mean, what women mean when they say I'm not old, is I will not accept the ideas this culture has about me. They do not fit my experience in any way. And in fact, I think for older women, ageism is probably a more serious challenge than aging. 
Aging, we do pretty well. Ageism is difficult to deal with. Our sexualities mocked, our bodies derided, our voices are silenced. And if we actually internalize those cultural messages, we can feel as useless as poinsettia is after Christmas. Uh, it's an interesting thing. I was just talking to Amanda about this in the green room, but there's no other life stage that's defined by what it isn't. In other words, we don't say, well, the way to describe babies is they can't do calculus. <laughs> or the way to describe teenagers is they don't know how to run companies. And yet when you get to old age, this country almost totally describes it by loss and diminishment. It's just an interesting flipping of, of how other cultures might define old age. With each new life stage, we find ourselves in an environment that pulses with more challenges than our current self can manage. If we don't grow bigger, we get bitter. And emergencies, which, of which we will have many in this life stage, call for emergent behavior, which is growth. Our growth is qualitative, not quantitative. With effort, we become deeper, kinder to ourselves and others, and more capable of bliss in this life stage. Of course, the world isn't divided into two types of women, those who grow and those who don't. All of us fit into both groups almost every day of our lives. Some of the time we're good copers and resilient human beings, and in other times we're reactive and pessimistic. Speaking for myself, I'm not a naturally sunny person. My skills have been hard won, and I'm not always sunny. Uh, but what I do have is a sense for I know the process. I know the process that will make me happier if I choose to engage with it. Now, one challenge I gave myself with this book was I realized when I started writing this book, I was thinking in male language because who did I read when I went to college in the 60s? I read Emerson and John Stuart Mills and Plato and Hemingway and... I read the canon, which was almost Sartre and so on and so on, almost all men. So I challenged myself to only use women's quotes for this book and do the research I needed to to find the quotes I would use. And funnily enough, it turned out about half the quotes are from Eleanor Roosevelt, who I just <laughs> feel great affinity for. But here's an Eleanor quote. The purpose of life is to live it, to taste experience to the utmost, to reach out eagerly and without fear for newer, richer experience. When we limit our belief in our potential to grow, we limit our incentive to grow. This life stage I'm in uh, is a both-and experience. Most likely, we'll feel some of life's deepest sorrows, but we'll also enjoy some profound epiphanies. The challenges and joys of this life stage are catalytic. We can see the love in our friends' faces, taste the rain, and hear the song of the meadowlarks. And we can do this even when we're walking out of a funeral or in pain from arthritis. We have the skills to do these things. Now, Amanda sort of stole one of my main lines, but contrary to cultural stereotypes, most older women are deeply happy. And the research comes from Dilip Jest at UC San Diego. And he found, and this is also true in the UK, that the happiest people in America in terms of well-being, life satisfaction, low levels of anxiety, depression, and stress are women over 65. And that holds, by the way, up until just the last two or three months of life. You know, most people last two or three months, they're sick. They don't feel very good, and that changes things. But up until that period... Most people are in the happiest life. And this is true when I talk to my friends and go, well, how are you, you know, do you like your life right now? Yeah, I'm having the most fun. A lot of people say that. Not all of them. I, you know, have friends who've lost husbands or have health issues and so on. But it's a common thing to say, this is a wonderful life stage. Now, I experienced a vivid illustration of the happiness of older women when I changed gyms. I was teaching at... <laughs> The university, oh, did you read this? Yeah. I was teaching at the University of Nebraska, and so I'd go to the UNL rec center. 
And the young women there, it's a tough life stage. The, you know, those college years, very tough life stage. But these young women, when they'd be in the, the dressing room, they'd be all hunched over like this, hiding their bodies. And if they spoke about their bodies, they'd go, oh, I don't have a thigh gap, or oh, you know, my arms are baggy, or they'd just go on and on. Criti or they'd talk about academic stress, relationship stress, uh, parental stress, et cetera, money stress. And it was a pretty stressed group of very modest, self-critical <laughs> young women. So then I joined a rec center for women my age called Proactive. And the, the funny thing that happened at Proactive was it was totally different. Women rocked around telling jokes all the time. And we wore utilitarian underwear or nothing. <laughs> And we didn't care. We didn't care if we had stretch marks and wrinkles and so on. We just joke. Here's a joke. So one day a woman says something to the effect of the kinder you are to them, the longer they last. And nobody quite heard what she was referring to. So somebody goes, what are you talking about? And every woman in the dressing room chipped in. And one of them goes, your swimsuits, your knees, your bank account, your husband. You know, everybody had a theory about that. But it was a very fun, easy place to be in terms of, of body acceptance and, and happy, calm people. Now, I want to distinguish between living lovingly and cheerfully and living a life of denial. I'm a psychologist. I, I know the, the pain and trouble secrets and denial bring to people. What I want to say is in this life stage, our sorrows and joys are as in intermingled as sea salt and water. And our, death, our depth comes from experiencing the entire human range of emotions, including profound tragedy. And our strength comes at this life stage from that which can destroy us. For example, at our age, we all start to sense, at my age, not everyone here is my age, the runway is short. And we have animations of mortality that can make us sad and fearful, but they can also wake us up. And Laura Christensen, psychologist, discovered that our perspectives and decisions about our lives change greatly depending on our perceptions of how much time we have left. The shorter we think our lives will be, the more likely we are to do things that are meaningful and give us pleasure. So the way I started saying this to my friends a few years ago, eventually is no longer a word to me. If I want to do something, I just do it. I don't go, well, eventually I'd like to go to a national park or whatever. Happiness is a choice and a set of skills. And once we've made the existential choice to be happy, we can develop the repertoire of skills we need to achieve our goals. It's never too late to become a happier person. Attitude isn't everything, but it's almost everything. And many times it's all we've got. Many times it's all we've got. In general, I argue it's not our genetics nor our external circumstances that determine our happiness. Rather, our happiness depends on how we deal with what we're given. All of our lives, we all make appoint we all keep appointments we did not make. Especially as we age, we see clearly that we don't always have control, but we have choices. And that is where we have our power. That is where we have our agency, is with our choices. I'll give you a good example of this. Um, a friend of mine's mother, my friend Yolanda's mother, was uh, a woman who had never taken drugs in her life. She's a hard physical, she did hard physical labor all of her life. Uh, she went into the hospital to have Yolanda. Eve went into the hospital to have Yolanda. But she uh, left the next day, and she's never taken even over-the-counter Advil. or She does not believe in prescription drugs or over-the-counter drugs. So she's dying of um, pneumonia, old person's friend, in a hospice, and her daughter's with her. And, and she's in pain. She's in a lot of pain from breathing. And so the doctor comes in and offers to give her a shot of morphine. And true to form, Eve starts to shake her head no. And Yolanda goes, come on, Mom, have some morphine. So she shakes her head yes, and the doctor administers the shot. 
At which point her clenched up body just totally relaxes and just, you know, just immediate relaxation. And Eve breaks into a big smile and says to her daughter with a wink, I've made a terrible mistake with my life. I should have been taking drugs all along. <laughs> now, older women have the most need of navigational skills, but we also have the most experience acquiring them. We've weathered strong storms and can hold a long view of life's journey. And we've learned to take responsibility for the most part for the emotional weather we create around us. So. When I was six years old, I saw an advertisement for a chihuahua and a teacup. Anybody my age ever see that advertisement? I wanted that little chihuahua so badly. It, you sent in a dollar to this magazine, you know, tear it out. You tore out this little slip and sent in a dollar. And supposedly within three to four weeks, you're, you're in the mail. Your puppy would arrive sitting in a teacup. <laughs> So I, I wanted this money for my mother, and she didn't want to give it to me. But I made such a fuss. She explained the concept of hoax, which really surprised me. I didn't realize adults lied to children like that, you know. <laughs> but anyway, finally, she, I think as a lesson, gave me this dollar, and I sent it in. And I already had named my Chihuahua Carmel. And I sat on my porch this one summer every day waiting for the postman to show up with a teacup with Carmel in it which of course never happened. Carmel never arrived. But at 71, I no longer send money for puppies in the mail. <laughs> Most of the time, I can manage my expectations. I don't give my adult children unsolicited advice. I don't expect anyone, including myself, to be good natured all the time. I love who I love, not in, only in spite of their flaws, but partly because of them. And I'm aware that the people who love me are equally merciful. Over time, life teaches us that everything comes with an asterisk. And um, as my Aunt Grace said it, a master of managing expectations, I get what I want, but I know what to want. I know what to want. Even in the roughest situations, we possess the possibility of self-rescue. And that's probably the core lesson of this book. Everything is workable. And here's another little story about this. So I have a friend out in San Francisco named Abby who's just gone through uh, ovarian cancer. And she had um, surgery. She had chemo. She had radio uh, radiation. And as we're sitting outside at a little sidewalk cafe, she's telling me that she's lost any sense of who she is. She feels hollow out inside as if there's no markers of the Abbey that was left and that her personality was drained from her from all these treatments. Well, just then we got a beautiful pot of, of um, peach tea and some uh, almond croissants and Abby sipped the tea and nibbled a croissant and she smiled at me and said, the Abby who loves croissants is coming back to me. <laughs> to grow into our largest, best selves, we must be able to claim our own lives. We need to sort out what we truly desire and then go for it. Now this kind of education for women is always hard won. Our culture educated us to be responsible, nourishing, uh, nurturing and available to others. Nobody taught women my age to take care of themselves. When someone needed my mother or my grandmothers or my aunts, they would automatically answer duty calls or your wish is my command. And in fact, duty always did call. Uh, my Aunt Agnes, for example, she lived on a farm outside of Flagler, Colorado, and we were out there quite a lot. My grandparents lived that way. Well. <laughs> She had the big Sunday dinner around the table for 14, 15 people. So she'd get up at dawn. She'd go out, chase down a few chickens, kill them, wring their necks, kill them, plunk them in hot water, pluck them. Then she'd gut them, bring them into the kitchen, cut them up, fry them, along with making biscuits and a couple pies and some fried potatoes and omelets and coffee and so on and so on, sliced tomatoes if it was the right sliced potatoes and tomatoes if it was the right time of year. So anyway, uh, then when people sat down to dinner, 
she never sat down. She just walked around the table refilling the biscuits and refilling the coffee cups. So she didn't eat. Her job was only to serve. Now, that's the model I had and many of us had growing up. And the interesting thing about that is we can, we can overcome that by granting ourselves the power of, yes, yes, I'm going to listen to my heart and do what it tells me I want to do, and granting ourselves the power of no. And the power of no, I mean, I decided I'm not sure ever in my life when somebody's asked me to do something, I've just said no. So I decided to do it one time. I mean, just to see what happened. And I almost felt like lightning would strike me dead. You know, it was some little request and I go, well, no. And I just thought, oh my goodness, that was really strange. But we don't have to say it that bluntly, but, but just to be able to stop and think, what do I want and respond based on that is a, really a big thing for women. The other thing I want to talk about is, is this business of living in the present. The only real time is notice time. All of us can find ourselves in what uh, Michael Pollan calls default mode functioning, ruminating and going over to-do lists. But if we learn the skill of waking up and savoring life, the present can be a great joy. Allie Smith said this beautifully. She said, now that I am nearly gone, I'm more here than I ever was. Uh, being present without an agenda can make the world a bigger place. I had that experience one day with my little grandson, Coltrane. I'd bought him a Viking, a little Viking set to put together, wooden set. And he came over after school, and I had it all ready to work on. And I'd go, Coltrane, he's about maybe six or seven. Let's get to work on this Viking set, Nana Bayou. And he kind of looks at it, and he doesn't really look that happy. And then he goes, can I have a snack first so we get a snack? And then I go, let's get to work, buddy, so we have time to finish this before your mom and dad come for you. So he kind of works on a couple minutes and then wanders away and turns on some music and starts dancing around. And I say in a grumpy way, Coltrane, Nana is not going to build this Viking ship by herself, you know, and kind of him just come back here, buddy. We've got this ship to build. And suddenly I realize, what the heck? He's dancing around and having fun. Why don't I join into that <laughs> dance with him and forget my agenda of this Viking ship, you know? Our consciousness is crafted entirely by attention. We find what we look for. If we move around the world looking for humor, beauty, or joy, we discover them all around us. In fact, it's been my experience that the happiest women in this, this, uh, in this group of women I interviewed and, and in the women I've known all my life have often been the women with the worst luck. And what's happened to those women is gratitude is not a sweet virtue or kind of a nice luxury thing that you have because it's good to be grateful. It's a survival skill. And they learn it to thank, they, they learn to thank the sun for rising in the morning. Tragedy often catapults people toward gratitude, whereas constant good fortune can make it acutely hard to feel grateful. Lucky people may habituate to a comfort, easy, comfortable, easy life, and small problems can engender big complaints. In fact, in my own uh, experience, people who have never suffered are, are likely to become insufferable. It's just, it's, it's, it's not the way to end up being a deep and happy person. Another thing that's been, for me, a great resource as I've gotten older is being able to look back on, on the shelter belt of family across. I, I, if I'm lucky, I'll live to see my great-grandchildren and I remember my great-grandmother so I'll live through seven generations of family and have this beautiful long view of what my people look like across all. And who has the same kind of spine? Who has the same kind of eyes? Who has the same way of making a funny face? And they're, they're, very, they're very important now to how I cope. For example, I was thinking about my grandmothers and it's only when I became a grandmother that I realized 
how much hard work it was to make good things happen for grandchildren every time they show up. And um, I remember with my grandmother, um, Margaret Agnes, there were always uh, ginger snap cookies in the jar. And one time I showed up and I go, what kind of cookies do you have? And she said, ginger snaps. And I go, my favorite kind. And she goes, well, I know that's your favorite kind. That's why they're ginger snaps is because I know they're your favorite kind. You know, when I have uh, trouble falling asleep at night, one of my tricks, this grandmother was beautiful to me. And she would ask me, she called me my Mary. I want my Mary to come help me with the dishes because, of course, nobody had dishwashers back then. And then when we'd get to the kitchen, I'd say, now, grandmother, let's take a long time and get these dishes done very, very slowly so we could have these long talks. Well, not too long ago, I was having trouble getting to sleep. And the way I could get myself to sleep was I could remember my grandmother's kitchen exactly, every detail. And I could open the cabinets and I could see the coffee cups and the plates and, and just, and then I crossed the sink and I remember she had a kind of a little thing that held her sponge and her dishcloth. And then I'm in another cabinet opening it up and seeing what's in there. And about the time I get to that cookie jar, I'm asleep. So there's still, you can take all this nurturing that you, you received from grandparents or parents or aunts. I had lovely aunts. And just, you can hold that to you now. And children, whether they're your grandchildren, your nieces, your neighbors, any children are really important to have in our lives. I remember I'm talking about my grandson Coltrane because he's my most recent that's been around and been funny in my life. But at five, he came home one time from his school and he discovered air quotes. And I cannot tell you how much fun you can have with a child who goes, shall we go get a snack, Nana? You know, how about reading a book? You know, just funny stuff like that. And another time I picked him up, I picked him up from school. He's three and he, I put him in, you know, one of those industrial strength car strengths, <laughs> seats that mothers have anymore. And I'm listening to Yo-Yo Moss on the cello as I drive him back to our house. And I hear him talking to himself. So I stop focusing on the music and I listen to Coltrane. And he's saying over and over again, beautiful, beautiful beautiful. So children, I, I mean, they can just really do it for us if we're lucky enough to have them around. Now, I don't want to over-idealize family relationships. There is nobody that can make me cry faster than a member of my own family. And certainly adult children can be trying. I speak from experience. And even in the best situations, grandparenting is complicated. Margaret Mead had a beautiful line about this. She said, grandchildren and grandparents have a great relationship because they're united against a common enemy. <laughs> Let me just briefly mention the great gifts of this life stage, and then we'll answer whatever questions you have. I call these the northern lights at the end of Women Roaring North. One of the great gifts is the possibility of authenticity, or what Margaret Fuller called the radiant sovereign self, which comes from growing out of our fear into wholeness. We lose our false selves acquired in childhood and carried with us through much of our own long journey. We can at last uncrook our hearts and tell the truth, at least to ourselves. The other thing is we learn how to take care of that crazy baby inside us. And when we do that, we can extend mercy to others and signal them there's no need for pretense. As we grow, we teach, and our lesson to the world can be, it's okay to be that flawed, messed up, contradictory, marvelous person you truly are. Time, attention, gratitude, and the moral imagination are the miracle grow of the human psyche. If we are growing, we experience our circle of caring expanding until my idea of the perfect life is by the time we die, our circle of caring is, is, is big enough to include every living being. 
and we have a sense that in our hearts, we are all the same. We're aware of our place in deep time. I mentioned the family, but we also start being aware of our place in evolutionary time. Our life histories reach back to the beginning of the universe and our hominid lineage, which is two million years old. Every one of us in this room is alive today because 30,000 generations of parents raised children who grew up to raise children, who grew up to raise children, who raised children, so that we could be here experiencing the miracle of life at this moment in time. And I'd like to, to quote just one line, and then we'll take questions, and that is, old age is not an illness. It is a timeless ascent. As power diminishes, we grow toward the light. That's May Sarton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So happily, any questions I'd love to I'd love to take. Hi. Please, sure. <laughs> um I, I I'm not sure. Have you found that with boomer uh retirees mm -hmm. that I guess I want to know what the role of purpose is and how how much that plays in the um, older years. I guess I feel that for me, community service, um, I have to have a purpose that I'm giving back somehow. And I know you're quite active in Nebraska with you're very active with Keystone pipe thing yeah. Yeah. and so while I haven't read your book in its entirety but while it focuses on relationships and what makes you happy um to what extent has, does having a purpose like and that can be defined in any way but sure. while it's not taking care of people it's giving back and that's fulfilling in itself right yeah right. thank you that's a good question well first of all my own experience of meaning and purpose is you, le you, lo you, you lose your need to be useful at the point you take your last breath. That it's, it's okay. a basic core human need to be useful. And my brother John, for example, had a stroke. And one of the things he said afterwards, he, he, he was an anest anesthesiologist at a hospital. And of course, he lost his job. He couldn't work after he'd had a stroke in a operating room. And I remember him struggling as he recovered from his stroke with, with, with a life that had been so busy and all of a sudden was, mm -hmm. was so empty. And he said to me at one point, you just can't go out and buy a pound of purpose, you know? And that's right. You have to create purpose For from yourself. your own resources. Now, I know how to do that for myself. There's a chapter in the book called Building a Good Day. And I think most people that are older build into their day work that seems to them meaningful and important, mm -hmm. you know, whatever that means to them. And I can't imagine many people being happy if they don't have it. Um, okay. You know, I have a sister with uh, dementia and she's on dialysis and a lot of problems. My sister, she's younger than me by quite a bit. I'm the oldest one. But anyway, when she moved into a nursing home, we were, she was a little gloomy about that. And I said, now, Jane, you have a really important job in this nursing home. You are cheerful and you like to laugh and there's going to be quite a few sad people mm -hmm. there. And when you get there, your day every day is to laugh and cheer people up mm -hmm. and joke around. And, and she does that. I mean, mm -hmm. she knows that's her job and she jokes with the staff. She jokes with people. So she has a purpose, you know, and I think it's a critical part I of every day. Thank but thank you. you for asking. Yes. Hi, much of what you say resonates with me. I'm wondering if we women of a certain age don't hold a monopoly on these wonderful feelings, and is there any way we can help younger women to experience the same joys that you're describing for us older women? Well, did everyone hear that question? You know, it's a really good question, and I was at a bookstore out in California not very long ago in the Bay Area, and, and a younger woman stood up and goes, well, I want to feel that way now. What should I do? You know, <laughs> And I, I think, of course, the skills of happiness, the skill of setting your intention, 
of resolving to be aware of your attitudes and the power they have to shape whether your life is happy or sad. Those are skills you can acquire at any life stage. On the other hand, I don't think there's anything like living 70 years to start to have a sense for how to make oneself and other people happy and, and what it means to have boundaries, what it means to love without judgment. Another thing that's very different between younger women and older women is older women are likely to have more time. Not all of us, uh, and some women work full time and, and, and wish they didn't have to and so on. But for example, I experience a lot more bliss now than I was young. And I, I don't think my propensity for bliss has changed, but I just am not in a hurry all the time. You know, when I was a young working mother with two or three little kids, I barely could make it into a restroom and get my, my hair washed every day to go to work. And now I get up in the morning, my morning routine is I sit and have a cup of coffee for half an hour and watch the sky. If it's stars, I watch the stars. If it's the sunrise, I watch the sunrise. Well, that's a beautiful joy producing experience that younger women just aren't likely to be able to have, you know. The other thing I've noticed is that it's easier for me to be kinder now because I'm not in a hurry. You know, if you're always have this long to-do list and kids to pick up at daycare and, you know, when you get home, you've got all these chores and bills and the phone's ringing and the kids, it's really hard to slow down and, and do these things that are kind to yourself and also kind to anyone you encounter. So I, I think some of it is, is, as I say, it's hard one, you know, but, but certainly, and we all know young women and, and young men for that matter, these are not all gender linked uh, skills and attitudes who are able to be much more in the moment, to be much more aware that their emotional well-being is their responsibility. You know, that's a really big thing. Women our age, if we look outside ourselves for validation, we're likely to feel pretty miserable because for the most part, people don't go around telling us how just wonderful and great we are. If we've learned at, at 71 that validation comes with, from within, we're likely to be pretty happy. So, yeah, please. Anybody else? Oh, please. There's a mic right over there. Uh, thanks for giving us this opportunity. Um, um, I resonate. I can reason with most of what you're saying, being in the same age category. One of my concerns is, have you ever done any analysis with other cultures that play into a lot of this, how we were brought up, you know, our attitudes, some of those cultures, whether you're indoctrinated or whether you, whether it's religious or cultural, that's very hard to sift through and come up to an equilibrium of some kind. Have you had any experience with other cultures that you, you know, could compare yeah. the U.S. culture with? How has that sure, been sure. for you? Well, the main experience I've had, I was an anthro major, so of course I in college did, but the main experience I had is I wrote a book on refugees and I got to know people from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was very interesting about refugees was for the most part, they were horrified by the way Americans treat older people. They were just horrified. They couldn't believe the rest homes. They couldn't believe the derogatory remarks about older people. They couldn't believe that adults talked badly about their parents. They just, it was amazing to them because almost all over the world in countries that aren't Western, um, there, there's a great respect for older people. And, and a great feeling of, I remember when I was doing that book, I asked a high school girl something about, do you argue with your mother? And she said, how could I argue with my mother? She gave me the gift of life. Well, that's a very, that's a very traditional view for a Vietnamese girl to have of, of her mother. That doesn't mean she doesn't have some tension with her mother, especially if her mother's an immigrant and she's trying to adapt to a new country with different rules. But the idea that you would resent or, or argue with a parent was, was just unbelievable to her. Thank you. Yeah. Please. 
Um, I think I've read all your books, and oh, I love you. them all. Thank and um, I p- was really surprised by your life story, and I think the title was Seeking Peace. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I listened to it so many times, too, on my oh, cross-country yeah, yeah, ride. Yeah. It's, a, it, it's wonder you learn so much. But can you talk a little bit about, on this book, for example, your writing process, how you acquired you know, the the research people that you did, how you organized all your material and how you went about writing it and how much editing had to go on back and forth. In other words, the whole picture from start to finish, how did you decide this was your next book? And then finally, do you have any other books coming? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, a really cool thing from my point of view is in June, June 4th, We're doing a 25th year anniversary update of Reviving Ophelia. And my daughter and I wrote it together and we did interviews and focus groups and looked at all the research. And so it's, we, we took out about 30 or 40,000 words and put in about 30 or 40,000 words. So we, she was with me at the, I was just at the psychotherapy networker conference at the Omni Shoreham and she and I did our first presentation on that. But uh, in terms of my writing process, Writing, if you're a writer, is so hard that you know you can only write stuff that really you're curious about and deeply matters to you. Otherwise, at least the way I, the way I write is I write 100 books and throw 99 of them away. I'm a very laborious writer. And this book took me probably three or four years. I did a lot of, of reading and research and talking to everyone I knew about, uh, I mean, everyone I personally knew about being older and what their experiences were. And then I started getting more organized and doing interviews. And I did some interviews. I, I, this is the happiest book I've ever written, by the way. And I, I didn't, I did all the interviews in this book were with women with maybe one or two exceptions that were resilient. I I didn't write about women who, who weren't uh, exhibiting some signs of resilience and coping, because those are the women that are going to be our role models as we figure out how to do our future. So some of them were were very poor. Some of them had serious disabilities. A couple of them had recently lost husbands, but they still had that that silver current of resilience running through their lives. And then to get a bigger sample than than the women of of Lincoln, Nebraska, who I knew. I had everybody I knew around the country recommend women. So I did a lot of phoners. I came back to New York City and did some interviews. I did some interviews out in Colorado and California. And so that's how I got my interviews. And mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, for me, writing is is just writing and rewriting and rewriting and having readers and having editors and my agent read it. And it my my trajectory goes from this is really fun doing all this research too. This is really hard getting anything down on paper to, oh my gosh, why am I even thinking I can write this book to, this is really bad to calling up my agent and going, you know, I don't think we should publish this. It's going to ruin my reputation as a writer <laughs> to eventually just about the time it goes to press, getting up to the point where I think, well, it's the best I can do, and maybe it's not as bad as I've been thinking. Of. I mean, I'm not a highly confident writer by any means. Uh-huh. Hmm. So thank, thank you. you. Okay, well, I'll see you up at this book table. Thank you all for coming. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.